Hello and welcome back. If you're trying to get a learning algorithm to do a task that humans can do, and if your learning algorithm is not yet at the performance of a human, then manually examining mistakes that your algorithm is making can give you insights into what to do next. This process is called error analysis. Let's start with an example. Let's say you're working on your cat classifier and you've achieved 90% accuracy, or equivalently 10% error on your dev set, and let's say this is much worse than you're hoping to do. Maybe one of your teammates looks at some of the examples that the algorithm is misclassifying and notices that it's miscategorizing some dogs as cats. And you know, if you look at these two dogs, maybe they look a little bit like a cat, at least at first glance. So maybe your teammate comes to you with a proposal for how to make the algorithm do better specifically on dogs. Right. You can imagine building a focus effort, maybe to collect more dog pictures, or maybe to design features specific to dogs or something, in order to make your cat classifier do better on dogs, so it stops misrecognizing these dogs as cats. So the question is, should you go ahead and start a project focused on the dog problem? There could be several months of work you could do in order to make your algorithm make fewer mistakes on dog pictures. So is that worth your effort? Well, rather than spending a few months doing this, only to risk finding out at the end that it wasn't that helpful, here's an error analysis procedure that can let you very quickly tell whether or not this could be worth your effort. Here's what I recommend you do. First, get about, say, 100 mislabeled dev set examples, then examine them manually, just count up count them up one at a time to see how many of these mislabeled examples in your dev set are actually pictures of dogs. Now, suppose that it turns out that 5% of your 100 mislabeled dev set examples are pictures of dogs. So that is if 5 out of 100 of these mislabeled dev set examples are dogs. What this means is that of the 100 examples, of a typical set of 100 examples you're getting wrong, even if you completely solve the dog problem, you'd only get five out of a hundred more correct. Or in other words, if only 5% of your errors are dog pictures, then the best you could reasonably hope to do if you spend a lot of time on the dog problem is that your error might go down from 10% error down to 9.5% error, right? So this is a 5% relative decrease in error from 10% down to 9.5%. And so you might reasonably decide that this is not the best use of your time. Or maybe it is, but um, at least this gives you a ceiling or an upper bound on how much you could improve performance by working on the dog problem. Right? And in machine learning, sometimes we call this the ceiling on performance, which just means, you know, what's in the best case, how well could working on the dog problem help you? But now, suppose something else happens. Suppose that when you look at your 100 mislabeled dev set examples, you find that 50 of them are actually dog images. So 50% of them are dog pictures. Now, you could be much more optimistic about spending time on the dog problem. In this case, if you actually solve the dog problem, your error would go down from this 10% down to potentially 5% error. And you might decide that halving your error could be worth you know, a lot of effort focused on reducing the problem of mislabeled dogs. I know that in machine learning, sometimes we speak disparagingly of hand engineer things or using too much manual insight, but if you're building applied systems, then this simple counting procedure, error analysis, can save you a lot of time in terms of deciding what's the most important or what's the most promising direction to focus on. In fact, if you're looking at a hundred mislabeled dev set examples, maybe this is a you know five to ten minute effort to manually go through a hundred examples and manually count up how many of them are dogs. And depending on the outcome, whether it's more like five percent or fifty percent or something else, this in just five to ten minutes gives you an estimate of how worthwhile this direction is and could help you make a much better decision whether or not to spend the next few months focused on trying to find solutions to uh, solve the problem of mislabeled dogs. In this slide, we've described using error analysis to evaluate whether or not a single idea 
dogs in this case, is worth working on. Sometimes you can also evaluate multiple ideas in parallel during error analysis. For example, let's say you have several ideas for improving your cat detector. Maybe you can improve performance on dogs, or maybe notice that sometimes what they call great cats, such as lions, panthers, cheetahs, and so on, that they are being recognized as you know small cats or house cats. So you could maybe find a way to work on that. Or maybe you find that some of your images are blurry and it would be nice if you could design something that just works better on blurry images. And maybe you have some ideas on how to do that. So if carrying out error analysis to evaluate these three ideas, what I would do is create a table like this. And I usually do this in a spreadsheet, but using an ordinary text file would also be okay. And on the left side, this goes through the set of images you plan to look at manually. So this maybe goes from 1 to 100, if you can look at 100 pictures. And the columns of this table, of this spreadsheet, will correspond to the ideas you're evaluating. So the dog problem, the problem of great cats, and uh, blurry images. And I usually also leave space in the spreadsheet to write comments. So remember, during error analysis, you're just looking at depth set examples that your algorithm has misrecognized. So if you find that the first misrecognized image is a picture of a dog, then I put a check mark there. And to help myself remember these images, sometimes I'll make a note in the comments, so maybe there was a pit bull picture. Um, if the second picture was blurry, then I make a note there. Um, if the third one was a lion on a rainy day in a zoo that was misrecognized, then that's a great cat on a blurry day, and I make a note in the comment section, you know, rainy day um, at zoo, and it was a rain that made it blurry, and so on. Then finally, having gone through some set of images, I would count up what percentage of these algorithms, or what percentage of each of these error categories were attributed to the dog or great cat or blurry categories. So maybe 8% of these images you examine turn out to be dogs, and maybe 43% um, great cats, and 61% were blurry. So this just means going down each column and counting up what percentage of images had a check mark in that column. As you're partway through this process, sometimes you notice other categories of mistakes. So for example, you might find that Instagram style filter, that is the you know, fancy image filters, um, are also messing up your classifier. In that case, it's actually okay partway through the process to add another column like that for the multi-colored filters, the Instagram filters and the Snapchat filters, and then go through and count up those as well and figure out you know, what percentage comes from that new error category. The conclusion of this process gives you an estimate of how worthwhile it might be to work on each of these different categories of errors. For example, clearly in this example, a lot of the mistakes were made on blurry images, and quite a lot were made on um, great cat images. And so the outcome of this analysis is not that you must work on blurry images. Um, this doesn't give you a rigid mathematical formula that tells you what to do but it gives you a sense of the best options to pursue. It also tells you, for example, that no matter how much better you do on dog images or on Instagram uh, images, you at most improve performance by maybe 8% or 12% in these examples. Whereas you can do better on great cat images or blurry images, the potential improvement, that is the ceiling in terms of how much you could improve performance, is much higher. So depending on how many ideas you have for improving performance on great cats or on blurry images, maybe you could pick one of the two, or if you have enough personnel in your team, maybe you can have two different teams. Have one work on improving errors on great cats, and a different team work on improving errors on blurry images. But this quick counting procedure, which you can often do in at most small numbers of hours, can really help you make much better prioritization decisions and understand how promising different approaches are to work on. So to summarize, to carry out error analysis, you should find a set of mislabeled examples out of your dev set, out of your development set, and look at the mislabeled examples, both false positives and false negatives, and just count up the number of errors that fall into various different categories. 
during this process, you might be inspired to generate new categories of errors. Like we saw, you know, looking through the example, you say, gee, there are a lot of Instagram filters or Snapchat filters. They're also messing up my classifier. You could create new categories during that process. But by counting out the fraction of examples that mislabeled in different ways, often this will help you prioritize or give you inspiration for new directions to go in. Now, as you're doing error analysis, sometimes you notice that some of the examples in your dev sets are mislabeled. So what do you do about that? Let's discuss that in the next video.